Everybody's made sure to turn your cell phones on, right? So, okay. That's right, it's opposite day, right? So, okay, good. Okay, hopefully we're all past that, so. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Okay, uh, so uh, what I want to talk about today is almost exclusively hemoglobin. I, I definitely want to get through it, um, and how far I get through it, I'll see. I'm not going to rush. Um, hemoglobin, I think, is one of the most interesting topics we talk about in this class. And it's because this protein has so many interesting features that we're able to do what we do. And it's with this protein that you can begin to see, I hope, how biochemistry has meaning for you. Okay? So it's with this that you begin to see physiology. You begin to see some really interesting things. The things that we've talked about with respect to protein structure and function now will hopefully start to come together. If I don't accomplish that today, then I guess I haven't given a very good lecture. So I've got a challenge ahead of me. Um, Hemoglobin is, uh, as I said last time, uh, related to myoglobin. And I showed you uh, a little bit about how um, the difference between the binding of uh, hemoglobin and the binding of myoglobin. So hemoglobin is a protein that has four subunits. Myoglobin has one subunit. Okay? And the difference between the binding affinity of these two proteins is significant. Myoglobin is very good at grabbing a hold of oxygen and holding on to it for dear life until the cell literally has no oxygen, at which point it starts to give it up. At the same concentration of oxygen, hemoglobin gives up a lot more. So if we're looking at the areas inside of the tissues, I know I hear that too. It seems to vary. It's like random. Maybe Friday is the microphone doesn't work. I mean, I, I, I don't quite understand this. Okay, if we look at the same concentration, approximately that of the tissues, myoglobin is holding on to a lot more oxygen than hemoglobin is. Only when the oxygen concentration has fallen below that where the cells are literally starving for oxygen does myoglobin start to give it up. So that wouldn't be a very good property for us to have for hemoglobin, okay? It wouldn't be a very good property at all because we wouldn't be uh, providing oxygen to the cells when they needed it. Well, on the other hand, we also want hemoglobin to, to be able to bind oxygen. And when we look at the oxygen concentration in the lungs, we see hemoglobin binds with essentially the same affinity that myoglobin does. So this means that hemoglobin has really two different states of binding oxygen. I'm going to describe these to you. So you may recall that I said that oxygen is bound at the heme group. And the heme group is where the iron is located. The iron atom plays the role, the important role, of binding to that oxygen. But it's much more uh, important than that. If we look at the relevant place inside of uh, hemoglobin, here is the heme ring. Okay? There's the heme ring. That's where the iron is. And you can see an oxygen, those two red guys right there, are an oxygen that has bound to that hemoglobin. You may remember from the lecture last time I told you that the binding of that oxygen causes that iron atom to be lifted by 0.4 angstroms, a very very tiny move. The binding of oxygen causes iron to move upwards. And since iron is attached to a histidine down here, that histidine, in turn, also moves up a corresponding amount. Well, since that histidine is attached to another amino acid, attached to another amino acid, attached to another amino acid, it's like the toe bone being connected to the foot bone, being connected to the ankle bone. No, I'm not going to sing connected to the shin bone, etc. If I pull on the toe, I'm going to see that effect go all the way through my leg, right? And maybe because I'm standing out here holding it like this and somebody is pulling on my toe, my other leg may be affected. I may have to change my balance to hold on, right? That's what happens in hemoglobin. You can see here that the pulling up, okay? So when we see the uh, deoxy, that's the one shown in gray. That's the one back here. We see this, the change that's happening throughout this subunit as a result of binding oxygen. This little alpha helix is moved slightly forwards compared to where it was when there was no oxygen. This movement slight forwards now changes the interaction of this subunit with the adjacent subunit. Guess what? The adjacent subunit also starts changing. So now the adjacent subunit has a slightly changed shape and that slightly changed shape of the adjacent subunit now causes it to be much more favorable for binding oxygen. 
So what we're seeing is a phenomenon that we describe as cooperativity. Cooperativity means that the binding of one molecule by a protein changes the affinity of the binding of the same molecule by other subunits of the protein. I'll repeat that. Cooperativity means that the binding of one molecule by a protein changes the affinity of binding that same molecule by other units of the protein. In this case, that change is a very positive one. Binding of one oxygen favors the binding of additional ones. That's how that concentration of oxygen bound is changing. When the other subunits start wanting to buy more oxygen, the, other, the oxygens jump onto those subunits much more readily. Okay? Very, very important point. That happens because of this very slight change that happens on the binding of the first oxygen. The binding of the first oxygen favors the binding of the second oxygen. The binding of the second oxygen favors the binding of the third, and the binding of the third favors the binding of the fourth. When they start coming off, the same sort of thing happens. Jumping off of one favors the jumping off of the next, favors the jumping off of the next, etc. That's a very cool phenomenon, cooperativity. In a positive sense, it's favoring binding. In a negative sense, it's favoring release of oxygen. Well, what I've just described to you are essentially two different states that those protein subunits can be in. A high affinity state where they bind oxygen and a low affinity state where they release oxygen. Okay? We give these states name, uh, names. R state stands for relaxed. Relaxed is a high affinity binding state. It's able to bind more oxygen. It's more flexible. It's able to accommodate oxygen much more. Conversely, the T state, which stands for tight, doesn't bind oxygen so well, and it releases it. So we have an R state and a T state. We'll see enzymes also have R states and T states. Hemoglobin is not an enzyme. It doesn't catalyze any reaction. R state and T state. So R favors binding, T state favors release, and it's happening because of these very tiny movements that we can see inside of hemoglobin. Okay, so hemoglobin is really great then for changing its affinity for oxygen depending upon the oxygen concentration. Low oxygen concentration, low affinity. High oxygen concentration, high affinity. Okay, now there's a lot more about hemoglobin besides that. You might say, wow, that's really suited for the needs of our body. But it turns out that hemoglobin has other features built into it that are absolutely remarkable, in my opinion. Okay? So, let's see. I was going to show you uh, this figure right here. Okay? This figure shows you the difference between deoxyhemoglobin, meaning it's a hemoglobin that has no oxygen bound, that's shown on the left, and oxyhemoglobin that has four oxygens bound on the right. And at this level, it's a little hard to see, but if you look carefully on the left side, you'll see a little bit of a, more of a gap in the middle of the donut than you see over here. You see very little gap. This is R state. This is T state. Okay? That gap right here is going to play a very important role in the next thing I'm going to tell you about hemoglobin, that gap right there in the donut. Okay. So. There's more to the delivery and binding of oxygen than simply cooperativity that happens. Okay? One of the effects is uh, re related to a molecule that our body makes called 2,3-BPG. 2,3-BPG stands for 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. You don't need to know the name if you don't want to, but make sure you get the, the, the initials right. 2,3-BPG. We'll talk later in the term about when our body, or how our body makes 2,3-BPG. But for our purposes right now, all we need to know is that cells that are going through rapid metabolism make a lot of 2,3-BPG. So if you have a, a muscle cell that's exercising, it's, it's contracting very, uh, very much, it's making a lot of 2,3-BPG. Okay, everybody got that?
Why do I tell you that? Well, it turns out that 2,3-BPG binds very nicely in that little donut, in that donut hole. In fact, it fits perfectly in that donut hole. Moreover, it can force its way into that donut hole and in doing so, convert hemoglobin from the R state to the T state. Well, if the T state is a low oxygen binding affinity, you can pretty quickly figure out what's happening. What's happening is hemoglobin that had any oxygens on it are now going to be let, is now going to be letting go of that oxygen because it's been moved to the T state. This works really well because a rapidly metabolizing cell has a greater oxygen need than one that's sitting around doing nothing. A rapidly exercising muscle cell is needing energy, is needing oxygen much more so than a skin cell. 2,3-BPG is a nice signal to the hemoglobin, this is a good place to dump your oxygen. It works really well. Okay? So 2,3-BPG, and if you want the structure, which you don't need to know, but I will show you. It's right here. Okay? It's a small molecule. It has three carbons, has two phosphates, and that's what it looks like. And it turns out it's a byproduct of a metabolic reaction that we'll talk about later. It's actually a byproduct. Okay? This is simply showing you what I just told you. Okay? If I have regular hemoglobin over here with no, no 2,3-BPG, and I have regular hemoglobin over here with 2,3-BPG, we can see that at the same concentration, more oxygen is released than when there's no 2,3-BPG. That graph is showing what I just told you. That's great. That's great it is unless you're a smoker. If you're a smoker, your blood concentrations of 2,3-BPG are higher than they are for non-smokers. That may seem like a little bit of a conundrum for you. This is favoring the release of oxygen. Shouldn't smokers have more oxygen if that's the case? Well, no. It turns out that in our bodies, when we have 2,3-BPG in a place in our body where there's rapid metabolism going on, hemoglobin grabs that 2,3-BPG, it takes it away, and on the way back to the lungs, 2,3-BPG gets released and broken down. By the time the hemoglobin gets back to the lungs, the 2,3-BPG is gone. If you're a smoker, when it releases it, and the blood already has a decent amount of 2,3-BPG, it's much more likely it's going to pick up another one and make it back to the lungs, where now it's going to be sitting in the lungs in the T state. Guess what's going to happen with that hemoglobin in the lungs? It's not going to pick up oxygen. That's a bad career move, okay? The reason that, one of the reasons that smokers get out of breath with, with light exercise is their blood has a significantly lower oxygen carrying capacity partly because of 2,3-BPG. Now, we'll talk later about why smokers have a higher level. You need to understand some metabolism before we get to that. That's the first question I always get, so I'll anticipate it. We will talk about that later, why. There's a very good reason why they have that. Okay? Or maybe a very bad reason why they have that. I shouldn't, shouldn't say it's good. That's one thing that affects the oxygen carrying capacity in a smoker. There's another big one, okay? And it relates to hemoglobin also. And that is the fact that smokers, as a result of smoking, ingest a lot of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide at the molecular level looks almost identical to O2 looks almost identical. In fact, it looks so identical that hemoglobin says, oh, look, there's some oxygen, and it grabs it. You've just reduced oxygen carrying capacity again. Carrying carbon monoxide doesn't get tissues what they need. In fact, carbon monoxide has other problems, as we'll talk about next term, that now the hemoglobin is actually delivering to the places where the carbon monoxide can have the most negative effect. So carbon monoxide competes with oxygen for binding to the heme group. Notice I said carbon monoxide, M-O-N-O, -O, not dioxide. Okay? Yes, Stephanie. Say, I'm sorry, the first part. Uh, 
Uh, do smokeless tobacco users have more 2,3-BPG in their blood? Than do smokeless tobacco users have more 2,3-BPG more in their blood than non-smokers? You know, that's a very good question. Uh, I believe they will, but probably not as much as a smoker will. Part of the problem with the smoker is the carbon monoxide and the non um, um, smoke, the smokeless tobacco user is not getting that carbon monoxide ingested. But they will have somewhat lower, but not as much. Good question. So everybody's going to go out and start doing smokeless tobacco, right? So. Okay, let's not do that. All right. Um, all right, so that's one of the effects uh, of hemoglobin. And this is now showing you that in that little donut, 2,3-BPG, it's a little better figure, fits in there absolutely beautifully. Okay? And it works very well as it's intended. It's smoking that actually screws it up. As it's intended, the more 2,3-BPG you're making, the more you're signaling, I'm exercising, I'm doing my thing, and the more those cells that need the oxygen are getting the oxygen. Okay, so that's one uh, consideration. Another consideration actually relates to hemoglobin, and that's fetal hemoglobin. Okay? Now, I need to describe, set this up for you a little bit. Fetal hemoglobin okay, is different from adult hemoglobin. So the adult hemoglobin has two alpha subunits that are identical and two beta subunits that are identical. Fetal hemoglobin, by contrast, has two alpha subunits that are identical and two gamma subunits that are identical. The betas are replaced by gammas. And the gammas are very much like the betas, but not identical. One of the ways in which they vary is that the, the gammas do not allow the binding of 2,3-BPG. So fetal hemoglobin cannot bind 2,3-BPG. What effect do you suppose that has on the fetus? It can't bind 2,3-BPG. So it can't go to the tight state. It's very good at staying in the R state, which means that it holds on to oxygen very well, which means that it's in the, in the R state a greater percentage of the time, and it's therefore able to take oxygen away from mom. The fetus has to be able to do that. If the fetus is competing with mom for oxygen, the fetus is probably going to lose that battle. Okay. Well, that's really good about getting oxygen in, but if you recall, hemoglobin had this great property of being able to get it in, but also to release it. If the fetus doesn't have a T state, isn't it going to be holding on to oxygen more as it's traveling through the fetus's body? Yes? No? Okay. Yes, it's going, to have a, it's going to have trouble with that. Why is it not a problem? Important to think about. Why is it not a problem? It's not a problem. Yeah? Well, the baby is doing some of that, but there's, another, there's a better reason. He said that he's, the baby is mostly anaerobically metabol metabolizing. Did you have a comment? Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> What's that? Babies don't have widely varying oxygen needs. Okay? So I'm out here, I'm running around, I'm jumping up and down, I'm screaming, I'm yelling at you, I'm complaining, I'm doing all these things, right? And these things change my oxygen needs. I'm sitting at my desk and I'm sitting there looking at Facebook and kind of doing this. I've got a low oxygen need, right? The fetus's oxygen needs are pretty constant doesn't get up and go jogging in the morning. It might kick mom a little bit, but it doesn't do anything more than that. So it doesn't have all of the, it doesn't require all the flexibility of oxygen that we have. By the time the fetus is about one to two years old, that fetal hemoglobin has converted to adult. Okay? So there's a transition that happens around the time of birth. Kind of cool, huh? Now, fetal hemoglobin is of interest because fetal hemoglobin it's encoded in our genes. We have, of course, the genes for the gamma subunits sitting there in our blood. And though I'm giving you a picture of black and white, they're only produced in very, very tiny quantities when we're an adult. We don't want to be producing mostly fetal hemoglobin because we do have varying oxygen needs, correct? 
turns out that this has been a strategy for some people to look at and under, uh, try to treat a very debilitating disease called sickle cell anemia. Now, sickle cell anemia arises because of a mutation in one of the subunits of hemoglobin, and there's several mutations that are known, that severely reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of a person who has this genetic disease. It tends to be more common among certain ethnic groups, although it's completely widespread across the globe. Okay? Every ethnic group has some people who have sickle cell anemia. What happens in sickle cell anemia is the mutation that's there favors the hemoglobin molecules in the deoxy state forming polymers. That is, instead of an alpha 2, beta 2, this alpha 2, beta 2 links to this alpha 2, beta 2, to this one, to this one, to this one, to this one. So they make a long chain, and they're inactive. They don't carry oxygen. They don't do any good. They cause problems. In fact, the problems that they cause is that these chains of these mutant hemoglobins are so long that they change the shape of the blood cell that they're in. That's the sickle cell part. Okay? They actually cause, under low oxygen concentrations, they cause the blood cell to move from being a sort of a nice, rounded, beautiful structure to assuming the shape of a sickle. And I think I've got a picture on here. Let's see, let me get that. It's a little out of sequence on the um, thing. Yeah, here we go. There's a normal blood cell. There's a sickled blood cell. This only happens under low oxygen concentrations. For a person with sickle cell anemia, this happens as, this, as the blood cells are traveling through the capillaries when the person is exercising reasonably heavily. Okay, there's different forms of sickle cell anemia. Some of them happen with very little exercise. Some of them happen with a lot of exercise. The problem then is that not just the shape of the cell, but in the capillaries, this guy gets stuck. It gets stuck in the capillaries. When a sickle cell, a person with sickle cell anemia has this problem arise, they get very, very painful problems arising from the fact that A, there's no blood moving through their capillaries. B, the muscle cells that are needing oxygen are literally starving to death because there's nothing coming through to deliver more oxygen to them. And C, on the longer term, the anemia kicks in. What's anemia if I say anemia? What's the definition of anemia? It's low concentration of blood cells. Anemias are low concentrations of blood cells. Well, how does this give rise to low concentrations of blood cells? It does so because when the body sees this guy right here, it assumes it's damaged and it takes it out of circulation. Even though if you gave it enough time, it would probably come back as okay, the body takes it out of circulation before that happens, the person with sickle cell anemia will always have a lower red blood cell count because a lot of their blood is being taken out of circulation. Okay? So there's several whammies that's, that's nailing the person with sickle cell anemia. How does that relate to fetal hemoglobin? One of the treatments is to induce the body to produce fetal hemoglobin as a way of treating this. Yes, sir? If they're producing fetal hemoglobin, you're correct. The fetal hemoglobin keeps the sickling from happening. All right? And though it doesn't deliver as much oxygen, because you've seen it doesn't have as much of a T state, it's delivering more oxygen than it would if it's in this state in which it's delivering none. Okay? So that's one of the treatments. There are other treatments for sickle cell anemia. There are many types of sickle cell anemia, but induction of the fetal hemoglobin is one strategy for treating this disease. Yes, sir? What induces differences in severity? It's actually the nature of the mutation. So there are different mutations in, and it's typically in the uh, beta subunit that, are, that it arises, although it can be in the alpha as well. But it's the nature of where the mutation is and it's what specific amino acid mutation it is. Uh, and that causes different amounts of this polymerization that happens, different levels of, of, of um, uh, sickling, et cetera. Okay, questions on that? Yeah. Uh, 
Well, so 23B, her question is, what, if 23BPG doesn't cause it to go into the T state, what causes it to go into the T state? Remember that 23BPG that is only one of the things that can favor that. So remember I talked about how we have negative cooperativity where it's letting go of oxygen? That also is kicking into place. So there, it's not that it can't absolutely go into the T state, it's just that 23BPG won't cause that to happen. Okay? Question that, that I sometimes ask on an exam. Okay. What about mom smoking? What, is, what does this do? What effect does this have on the fetus? What's the effect? Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Okay. Well, I won't touch that one. So what happens? Is the baby hosed? Is the baby's hemoglobin affected? No? Okay. The effects are not at the level of the fetal hemoglobin. The effects are different. Remember, mom is smoking, so she has, she's carrying carbon monoxide, so she has a reduced oxygen carrying capacity in the first place, right? And she's got more T state than R state, so she's got a reduced capacity. So the fetus is getting reduced oxygen, but once the oxygen's in its body, that 2,3-BPG is having no effect on it. The problems arising from mom smoking arise from mom's reduced oxygen carrying capacity, not from effects that happen in the fetus. And yes, mom can pass on that carbon monoxide as well. So there's some real problems with mom smoking. Okay. Interesting stuff. Now, I'm jumping around a little bit, partly because your book doesn't really go in the order that I like to talk about these things. Um, are there other questions before I move on to yet another interesting aspect of hemoglobin? Yeah. Can a fetal hemoglobin give oxygen to the mom? Well, in essence, any of these things are reversible, so I guess that's the case, but over the long term, that's not a possible strategy because the fetus doesn't have an oxygen generating capacity. So, yeah, there can be some exchange that happens there, but it's not significant. Yeah. And it would not be to the fetus's advantage at all. Okay, well, let's talk about yet another component of hemoglobin. And it was with this component that we can start to see now this nature of the movement of both oxygen and carbon dioxide in our bodies. Carbon dioxide I haven't talked about yet. Carbon dioxide is produced by metabolism. So that muscle cell that's out there cranking, doing its thing, is producing not only 2,3-BPG, it's also producing carbon monoxide as a product of the oxidation that it has to, to, to do to support the energy needs of that muscle cell. I'll get to that in just a minute. Before I talk about that, and you'll see why I, I, I bring that up first, before I talk about that, though, I need to talk about yet another interesting property of hemoglobin. This is called the Bohr effect. The Bohr effect is shown on the screen. And I'm going to describe it to you. Again, notice the axes. The axes are important. What fraction of hemoglobin ha is full of oxygen? And there's the oxygen concentration on the, on the x-axis. If we take the same hemoglobin under exactly the same conditions, but only slightly different concentrations of protons, we discover the following. At pH 7.4, we have greater affinity for oxygen than we have at pH 7.2. That's a fairly small change in pH, but that small change in pH favored the release of oxygen by hemoglobin. Well, guess what? Rapidly metabolizing cells produce carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, we'll talk about an enzyme that converts it into carbonic acid, produces protons. Those protons are a sign that the hemoglobin is in an area where a cell is rapidly metabolizing. So protons are present just like 2,3-BPG is present around actively metabolizing cells. That hemoglobin hits that area, there's a double whammy. 2,3-BPG binds, favors release of oxygen. Protons bind, and I'll show you how and why later, and favors the release of oxygen. 
those cells that need the oxygen most are jumping up and down and the hemoglobin is responding and giving them back that oxygen. That makes sense? Okay. Now, the Bohr effect happens as a result of protons. It also happens as a result of carbon dioxide. Oop, wrong one. Sorry. All right. Here is another plot, okay? pH 7.4 shown in red, no carbon dioxide. pH 7.2, no carbon dioxide. That's what you saw in the last figure. So therefore, the increase in protons favors the release of oxygen by hemoglobin. Same pH, 7.2, but now in the presence of carbon dioxide, look what happens. Yet a greater decrease in oxygen affinity. So we've got three things around rapidly metabolizing cells that cause oxygen, um, cause hemoglobin to release oxygen. 2,3-BPG, protons, and carbon dioxide. Those three things cause hemoglobin to let go of oxygen. It's affecting cooperativity. It, these are all affecting cooperativity. That's correct. Okay? But these are three molecules that are found near rapidly metabolizing cells that signal it's time to let go of oxygen. Well, how is it that these things can do this? How is it that these things can do this? I've talked about how 2,3-BPG binds to the donut. It favors the T state. Okay? Let's look at what happens with the binding of protons. Okay? Oh. Yeah, that's not a real good one. Let's see. Where is what I want? Right here. Okay? If we look inside of a hemoglobin molecule, okay, what we discover is that hemoglobin has a lot of histidines. You've already seen one of them was holding on to that iron in the heme group, right? There are other histidines. The histidines I'm talking about here are not that histidine from before. So it's a different set of histidines. The histidine side chains are capable of interacting with carbon dioxide, as you can see here. And when they do, they form a carbamate uh, complex shown here and release a proton. Protons, of course, are favoring shape changes in the protein that are favoring the release of oxygen. So binding of carbon dioxide is favoring the release of protons. That's one. Okay. Protons by themselves can go to histidine side chains and bind and change their charge. When they change the charge, they slightly change the shape. They slightly reduce the affinity of that subunit for oxygen. So now you see all th how all three of these work. 2,3-BPG binds the donut, favors the T-state. Carbon dioxide binds the histidine side chains and favors the um, uh, formation of a carbamate. Protons bind to histidine side chains, change the charge, and change the shape of the protein. All of these things combine to favor the release of oxygen by hemoglobin. Question? Yeah? What would result in a negative cooperativity? Yeah, you said there's positive and negative. Sure. Um, with these three combined, you said that it favors it. So. Yep. So, so these three are all favoring the release of oxygen, which uh, is not cooperativity per se. They're, fa they're reducing the binding affinity for oxygen. Cooperativity is simply that uh, phenomenon when we see one oxygen coming off, others are favored to come off. Okay? That's negative cooperativity. So that, ha that can happen completely independent of this, okay? This, this isn't cooperativity. This is, this is actually a molecular uh, process that's happening. It's favoring release. So it's another way of favoring release of oxygen. Does that make sense? Yes, sir? How does the presence of carbon monoxide affect this reaction? The only effect carbon monoxide has is it competes with oxygen for binding to iron. <laughs> 
and therefore reduces the oxygen carrying capacity. It has nothing to do with releasing oxygen or any of that. It turns out that carbon monoxide tends to bind iron a little bit more tightly than oxygen does. It's hard to get rid of. Yeah, so that's a problem. Yes, sir? Is there what? I'm still not sure I understand what the question is. Um, so when a uh, blood cell uh, attaches to a carbon monoxide, um, oh, does it, does a blood cell that's attached to carbon monoxide get targeted for destruction or something like that? Yeah. No, no, it doesn't change shape or any of that. It looks just like oxygen. The body has no way of recognizing that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, one thing I didn't mention here is this: the ring. I've never used this term before, but the ring. Uh, on a histidine is called an imidazole ring. That's a, that's a term that we'll use a lot here, and I should have mentioned that. An imidazole, I-M-I-D-A-Z-O-L-E, and that's that ring uh, right here. Okay, let's see. Now, that's a lot of material. The last thing I want to talk about relative to the Bohr effect is to basically tell you how hemoglobin is playing such a critical role in our body, not only in delivering oxygen, but also in getting rid of carbon dioxide. Because remember, carbon dioxide is binding those histidines. It's getting bound there and it's getting carried back to the lungs. I should point out that carbon dioxide is also carried in the bloodstream. Remember, we, we made a, a carbonic acid. Carbon dioxide plus water makes H2CO3. We'll talk about that later, so you don't need to worry about that reaction right now. But that's an acid, car carbonic acid. All right, Carbonic acid ionizes to form bicarbonate. HCO3 minus. That's the biggest buffer in our blood. The most important buffer in our blood arises from carbon dioxide. It's bicarbonate. Okay? Bicarbonate also allows carbon dioxide to make it back to the lungs. So there's two ways of getting carbon dioxide back to the lungs. One is being carried by hemoglobin. The second is by being a bicarbonate buffer, it's carried directly back to the lungs as it is. Now that's important when we think about how do we get rid of carbon dioxide. Let's follow what this hemoglobin has done. It started out empty of oxygen in the, blood, in, the, in the lungs. The lungs grabbed one, favored the binding of the second, favored the binding of a third, favored the binding of a fourth, and now the hemoglobin is full of oxygen. Hemoglobin goes out to the tissues and starts dumping that oxygen, partly by, co by negative cooperativity, Partly by protons, partly by carbon dioxide, partly by 2,3-BPG. It ends up empty of oxygen, but now it's carrying carbon dioxide. It goes from those tissues where it's carrying carbon dioxide. It may have some 2,3-BPG, but it's going to release that, and that'll get burned up. It's carrying this carbon dioxide back to the lungs, and it gets to the lungs where the oxygen concentration is really, really high and that high oxygen concentration literally forces that carbon dioxide off of the hemoglobin. It literally forces it off because the hemoglobin changes shape on the binding of oxygen and that change in shape favors the release of carbon dioxide. It's coming off that, at that point as a gas and you exhale it. So the bicarbonate, when it gets back to the lungs, uh, can encounter protons. And when it encounters protons, it makes the carbonic acid, which in turn is converted back to carbon dioxide, which is also exhaled. So two ways of releasing that. And I'll put this in the highlights. I know I'm kind of going over that kind of fast. But two ways of releasing that carbon dioxide that, was ori that originated from the tissues that were metabolizing it. Did, did I answer your question OK? That's correct. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So that's the Bohr effect. The Bohr effect, as you can see, is kind of complicated, but it involves carbon dioxide, it involves protons, um, and it involves, obviously, hemoglobin's carrying of these things. Okay, that said, I, think, I do have a song that covers this. I would like to sing a song. Okay, yay, okay, it's Friday, right? So we have to sing a song. All right. So uh, this one is to another Christmas tune. And yes, I do have songs to things that aren't Christmas tunes, but a lot of the early ones are.
This was to the tune of Santa Claus is Coming to Town. It's called Hemoglobin is Moving Around. <laughs> Please join me. Oh, isn't it great what proteins can do, especially ones that bind to O2. Hemoglobin's moving around. Inside of the lungs, it picks up the bait and changes itself from T to R state. Hemoglobin's moving around. The protoporphyrin system, its arm makes such a scene. Arising when an O2 binds, pulling up on histidine. The binding occurs cooperatively, thanks to changes quaternary. Hemoglobin's moving around. It exits the lungs, engorged with O2, in search of a working body tissue. Hemoglobin's moving around. The proton concentration is high and has a role. Between the alpha betas, it finds a metazole. To empty their loads, the globins decree. We need to bind 2, 3, BPG. Hemoglobin's moving around. The stage is the set for grabbing a few cellular dumps of CO2. Hemoglobin's moving around. And then inside the lungs it discovers oxygen and dumps the CO2 off to start all over again. So see how this works. You better expect to have to describe the Bohr effect. Hemoglobin's moving around. <laughs> I'm not very good at those high notes, and I always start too high. You know, so. Okay, so we've got about, ten, about five, ten minutes. So that gives us a chance to get started on enzymes. I'm a little bit behind, so rather than finish early, I will actually start in on enzymes. Yeah, I know, I know. I feel the same way, but if we don't, then we'll make it faster later, so we have to get into it. Okay, now, you've seen with hemoglobin, how slight changes in the structure of a protein can have drastic effects on the action of that protein. That's a very good prelude for us to start considering enzymes because enzymes do very much the same thing, only now they're catalyzing reactions. Hemoglobin doesn't catalyze any reaction. Okay. One of the enzymes we'll talk about is the one I've been talking about earlier today. It's called carbonic anhydrase, and it catalyzes this reaction here. Carbon dioxide plus water makes carbonic acid, H2CO3. This enzyme, as I hope to convince you later, is one of the most remarkable enzymes in your body. It's one of the most remarkable enzymes in nature. It does some things that you're frankly going to find hard to believe. I find it hard to believe, and I know how it works. Okay. Um, here is a table. Unfortunately, it's fairly small. But it shows something about the incredible variety of enzymes and something incredible about how fast enzymes speed up a reaction. The difference between an enzyme and a chemical catalyst is primarily that an enzyme is a hell of a lot more efficient at doing what it does than a chemical catalyst is. A chemical catalyst might be good to speed up a reaction 100 or 1,000 fold. Okay? If we look at the top guy up here, OMP decarboxylase, it speeds up a reaction from an uncatalyzed rate of 2.8 times 10 to the minus 16th, and that's a micromolar per second, which we'll talk about later, meaning it basically it has, it's making 39 molecules Okay, of this stuff per second when it's catalyzed by an enzyme. That's pretty good. When it's not catalyzed, the half-life of that reaction is it only does half of what it does in 78 million years. Okay? This is a rate enhancement of 10 to the 17th. That's in the quintillionths. Okay? That's a phenomenal. It's hard to understand at some level how much enzymes can speed up reactions. 
Do all of them work that fast? No. In fact, here's one that works. It's only 7.7 .7 million times faster than an uncatalyzed reaction. That's carbonic anhydrase. It's poking along. Well, as I hope to convince you, it's not just poking along. It's poking along compared to this guy. This guy starts out at a fairly fast half-life already. It's starting out at, at five seconds for a half-life, and it's getting sped up immensely. Okay? A more important figure to look at is this thing right here, the catalyzed rate. I said that OMP decarboxylase converts 39 molecules of substrate. And by the way, enzymes catalyze reactions on molecules called substrates. The things that they bind to are called substrates. And during the catalysis, a substrate is converted to a product. The rate with which OMP decarboxylase does that is 39 per second, meaning that each molecule of enzyme, that is each individual enzyme, is converting 39 molecules of substrate to 39 molecules of product every second. That's pretty damn good. 39 per second. Okay. I'll wager you can't think of doing something, 39 things per second. It's, 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 you can't do it. What's unfathomable is what carbonic anhydrase does. Okay? Its rate, and that is not a misprint up there, is 1 times 10 to the 6th molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. 1 million molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. That's something I can't fathom. Okay. I can't fathom that. It tells us something very, very interesting about what's happening at the molecular nanoscopic scale that's different than what happens in the real world, in the macroscopic world that we live in. We can't conceive of doing something in the millions of times per second. Electronics work at that level because they're also working at the nanoscopic level. Macroscopic things in the world don't work at millions of things per second. These enzymes are doing things that are really interesting. Okay? They're really interesting. Hello. No, I won't do that. Okay. <laughs> I got a bad enough reputation as it is. I don't want to get any worse. Okay. So um, it's really hard to get a handle on that. Now you might say, well, how come they don't all have that rate? Why don't, why don't all of them do it at this rate? And my answer to that is the same as, well, why doesn't everybody own a Ferrari to drive to Fred Meyer? If everybody jumped in a Ferrari and drove 200 miles an hour to Fred Meyer, we would see some things that were a little out of control, right? <laughs> Reactions going so fast make it harder for the cell to control them. <coughs> So there are some reactions in the cell that we want to go fast as hell. And there are others that we don't want to go so fast because we want to be able to control them. Okay. Now, carbonic anhydrase, I'll talk about later, is an example of an enzyme that has a property that we refer to as being perfect. Perfection. Why do we call it perfect? Because it is known that any single mutation to that enzyme converts it into a less efficient enzyme. It cannot be improved any further by additional mutation. It is perfect. Its perfection is reflected in the fact that the only thing that slows this enzyme down is how fast the substrate can diffuse to the enzyme. That's the only thing that slows it down how fast the substrate can diffuse to the enzyme. It's diffusing at a million per second, so it's still got a pretty darn good rate. If it could diffuse faster in water, the enzyme would actually be faster. That's the only thing that slows it down, is the rate of diffusion. That is what a perfect enzyme is. Now, next time I'm going to talk about how enzymes do what they do. And I'm going to give you this in an ener energetic perspective, but I won't do that today. OK, see you guys on Monday. Study hard. Yes, ma'am. OK, you said that, um, I think you said this, that um, the, higher, the higher pH gives you a greater affinity. Higher affinity, higher affinity yeah. To release it, O2. 
No, greater affinity means holding on to it. So lower affinity oh, okay. means releasing. So lower, that's okay. Right. Okay. okay there we go. Hi. Go ahead. Okay, I'm confused. So okay. if we're talking about negative versus cooperative, negative cooperation versus positive cooperation. Yep. We have if we hemoglobin exhibits both, it means that if what hemoglobin exhibits both, yep. it means binding to more oxygen. It means favoring of binding to more oxygen. If it's positive, for positive, and uh -huh. negative cooperation would be favoring release. Right. So I don't understand how if you have say two of the you know two of the subunits on it are carrying oxygen, uh -huh. then would that favor positive cooperation and want to pick up more, or negative cooperation and want to drop one to that? Depends on the environment it's in. If it's in a low oxygen environment, it's going to favor release because there's not going to be oxygen to pick up. If it's in lungs, it's going to favor pickup because there's going to be plenty of oxygen to grab. So the oxygen, suggests, the oxygen concentration drives it. But that suggests that it doesn't exhibit negative or positive cooperation internally, but it just depends on the environment. Absolutely. The oxygen drives it. Oxygen drives it. The enzyme is, the, 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 the hemoglobin is there to accept or release as appropriate. Come on, I, let's come back this way. I got I to do the camera. Hi, how you doing? Good. Good. Do you, you have a second? Uh, let me get the camera. I've got to answer a couple questions here. I can uh, talk to you, Sarah. Oh, happy mouth full Friday. of a lecture today. What's that? Happy Friday. Yeah, it was a happy Friday. But for you, I hope. Um, so far. So far. So the, the environment drives, kind of like when I said that oxygen drives off the carbon dioxide, oxygen concentration really really drives that. So it drives the, the binding of it and it binds the release of it um, uh, if there's no oxygen there. So, um, so okay. I would disagree with what you said. No. Okay, well so if you take hemoglobin, right, and you give it some oxygen, uh -huh. it, it changes the structure of the protein such that it would like to pick up more oxygen. So that it's capable of binding more oxygen. Mm -hmm. right? Or it favors the pickup of more oxygen. If there's oxygen. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm sorry.